Welcome listeners. You are listening to a podcast from the Free People's Movement, out of Sweden. Episode 15. Roe v. Wade. The Hidden Agenda. If you are listening to the audio-only version of this podcast, make sure you follow us on YouTube and Rumble, as this episode contains some supporting graphics. We will in this episode dive into history, to shine light on what Roe v. Wade, was really all about. But first we will provide a bit of background. Until the late 19th century, abortion was legal in the United States before quickening, the point at which a woman could first feel movement of the fetus, typically around the fourth month of pregnancy. Some of the early regulations related to abortion were enacted in the 1820s and 1830s and dealt with the sale of dangerous drugs that women used to induce abortions. Despite these regulations and the fact that the drugs sometimes proved fatal to women, they continued to be advertised and sold. In the late 1850s, the newly established American Medical Association began calling for the criminalization of abortion, partly in an effort to eliminate doctors' competitors, such as midwives and homeopaths. Additionally, some nativists, alarmed by the country's growing population of immigrants, were anti-abortion because they feared declining birth rates among white, American-born, Protestant women. In 1869, the Catholic Church banned abortion, at any stage of pregnancy, while in 1873, Congress passed the Comstock Law, which made it illegal to distribute contraceptives and abortion-inducing drugs through the U.S. mail. By the 1880s, abortion was outlawed across most of the country. During the 1960s, during the women's rights movement, court cases involving contraceptives laid the groundwork for Roe v. Wade. To gain more public support for abortion, several court cases were driven forward, with the intent to make birth control inaccessible, and to lay the groundwork for making use of the 14th Amendment, the right to privacy, in regards to abortions. In 1965, the U.S. Supreme Court struck down a law banning the distribution of birth control to married couples, ruling that the law violated their implied right to privacy, under the U.S. Constitution. And in 1972, the Supreme Court struck down a law prohibiting the distribution of contraceptives to unmarried adults. Then came Roe v. Wade. It became a landmark legal decision, issued on January 22, 1973, in which the U.S. Supreme Court struck down a Texas statute banning abortion, effectively legalizing the procedure across the United States. The court held the opinion that a woman's right to an abortion was implicit in the right to privacy, protected by the 14th Amendment in the Constitution, making the courts argue, in previous cases, that the right to privacy was connected to the use of contraceptives, they now used the same rhetoric regarding abortion. Which was the plan all along? Meanwhile, in 1970, Hawaii became the first state to legalize abortion, although the law only applied to the state's residents. That same year, New York legalized abortion, with no residency requirement. By the time of Roe v. Wade in 1973, abortion was legally available in both Alaska, New York, Hawaii and Washington. Jane Roe, whom we now know as Norma McCorvey, was just 21 years old when she became pregnant for the third time and sought an abortion in the state of Texas. Texas law, however, stated that a woman could only undergo an abortion if the mother's life was at risk. McCorvey was put in contact with two lawyers, Linda Coffey and Sarah Weddington, who were looking for a pregnant woman to help them build a case to legalize abortion. McCorvey lied and said she had been raped. That lie became the basis for the legal fight against the district attorney of Dallas County, Henry Wade. The lawyers knew that the case would never be finished in time for McCorvey to get an abortion and she ended up giving birth and placing the child for adoption. In 1994, McCorvey published her autobiography, I Am Roe. At a book signing, McCorvey was befriended by Flip Benham, an evangelical minister, and the national director of the anti-abortion organization Operation Rescue. She converted to evangelical Protestantism and was baptized on August 8, 1995, by Benham, in a Dallas, Texas, backyard swimming pool, an event that was filmed for national television. 
Two days later, she announced that she had quit her job at an abortion clinic and had become an advocate of Operation Rescue's campaign to make abortion illegal. She voiced remorse for her part in the Supreme Court decision and said she had been a pawn for abortion activists. In 2004, McCorvey sought to have the U.S. Supreme Court overturn Roe v. Wade, saying that there was now evidence that the procedure harms women, but the case was ultimately dismissed in 2005. On January 22, 2008, McCorvey endorsed Republican presidential candidate Ron Paul because of his anti-abortion position. McCorvey appeared in the 2013 film Doombie, in which she delivers an anti-abortion message. She is also the subject of Joshua Prager's 2021 book, The Family Row, An American Story. She then switched sides again. In a documentary, aka Jane Roe, that premiered on TV station FX, which was filmed at her nursing home, in the year before her death, an ailing McCorvey comes out with a self-described shocking, deathbed confession. The whole thing was a lie, one that the evangelical movement apparently paid her hundreds of thousands of dollars to participate in. I was the big fish to them, she says dispassionately, breathing through an oxygen tube. I think it was a mutual thing. I took their money, and they put me out in front of the cameras and told me what to say. When the pro-abortion movement used her to get Roe v. Wade passed, she played along, for her own benefit. When the evangelical pro-life movement offered her money to switch sides, she played along once more. We're guessing that she also was well compensated for the new documentary. Self-serving, to the end. The fact that Norma McCorvey has played both sides of the abortion issue for money only speaks to her own moral shortcomings. The facts are still the facts. On Friday, June 24, 2022, the Supreme Court overturned Roe v. Wade. This ruling solidifies a decades-long pursuit of the Republican Party in appointing conservative justices to the highest court in the country, one of the defining legacies of Donald Trump's presidency, who appointed Neil Gorsuch, Brett Kavanaugh and Amy Coney Barrett, all of whom counted among the 6-3 majority ruling, alongside Justice Clarence Thomas, who was appointed by President George W. Bush. Justice Samuel Alito penned the court majority, arguing that the 1973 ruling and repeated subsequent high court decisions, affirming Roe must be overruled because they were egregiously wrong, with exceptionally weak arguments that were so damaging they amounted to an abuse of judicial authority. Chief Justice John Roberts wrote a separate concurring opinion. So, the Supreme Court has now asserted that the right to an abortion is not within the rights afforded to every citizen per the Constitution, and that it's up to the respective states to legislate on this issue. So, what's all the fuzz about? Why is it so important to the radical left and the mainstream media to have the right to abortion cemented in the Constitution? Simple question, with some sinister answers. Here is a short clip with Margaret Sanger, founder of the American Birth Control League, which later became the American arm of Planned Parenthood, but more on that later. Do you believe in sin? When I say believe, I don't mean in believe in committing sin. Do you believe there is such a thing as, a, as sin? Well, I think the greatest sin in the world is bringing children into the world that have disease from their parents, that have no chance in the world to be a human being, practically, delinquents, prisoners, all sorts of things, just mock when they're born. That, to me, is the greatest sin that people can, can commit. Murder is a sin. Well, I naturally think murder is a, well, it's a sin or not. It's a terrible act. In New York City, she organized the first birth control clinic to be staffed by all female doctors, as well as a clinic in Harlem. The Negro Project was an initiative conceptualized by Margaret Sanger, the aim of the project was officially to spread awareness of contraception, to lower poverty rates in the South. What could the real reason have been? While the world would rightly condemn the Nazis for their worldview of eugenics, few people realize that Margaret Sanger, founder of American Planned Parenthood, held the same ideas and beliefs as Hitler did. The goal of her organization, the Birth Control League, later to be named Planned Parenthood, was to help create a superior race, a racially evolved mankind, as we will soon see.
In her book, Woman and the New Race, Sanger mentions three different viable options for removing unfit people from society. Option number one, the brutish method of war. This is the option Hitler chose and which Sanger agreed with, in order for Germany to purify itself from overpopulation, and from weak and inferior people. War wasn't her personal approach, but she agreed that Hitler's argument was sound. Though she would conveniently criticize Hitler later once his belief in eugenics came under attack. Option number two, to let the defectives and stupid people die out, by allowing disease and other natural remedies to take their toll and lead them to their natural end. In other words, do not work to save the sick and dying people of society. Just let them die. This is one reason that Sanger abhorred the Catholic Church and her charities because it just kept these defectives alive longer and used up precious resources. She has a whole chapter in her book vehemently attacking charities. Option number three, by using birth control, sterilization and segregation, which she called the more sane and civilized approach to racial superiority. She had the same philosophy and goal as Hitler, just a different method. For Sanger, birth control, segregation, sterilizations, and abortion if necessary, could help the population to evolve faster by removing weak people, weak in mind, body, health, and economic conditions. Thus, while she may have ideas to help women and help make healthier families in some sort of warped way, her motives were completely eclipsed from the start due to the bizarre worldview from which she operated. While trying to help women, she simultaneously sought to weed out inferior races and unfit people, including women, ironically, and with force if need be. Sanger also wrote a book entitled The Pivot of Civilization. In it she states, birth control is the pivot of civilization. Birth control, which has been criticized as negative and destructive, is really the greatest and most truly eugenic method, and its adoption as part of a program of eugenics would immediately give a concrete and realistic power to that science. As a matter of fact, birth control has been accepted by the most clear-thinking eugenists as the most constructive and necessary means to racial health. Margaret Sanger also wrote, The most urgent problem today is how to limit and discourage the overfertility of the mentally and physically defective. Possible drastic and even Spartan methods may be forced upon American society if it continues complacently to encourage the chance and chaotic breeding that has resulted from our stupid, cruel sentimentalism. Sanger continues, The emergency problem of segregation and sterilization must be faced immediately. Every feeble-minded girl or woman of the hereditary type, especially of the Moran class should be segregated during the reproductive period. Otherwise, she is almost certain to bear imbecile children who in turn are just as certain to breed other defectives. The male defectives are no less dangerous. Segregation carried out for one or two generations would give us only partial control of the problem. She continues, when we realize that each feeble-minded person is a potential source of an endless progeny of defect, we prefer the policy of immediate sterilization, making sure that parenthood is absolutely prohibited to the feeble-minded. Margaret Sanger's ideas about eugenics are shared by many more people. As a more recent reference, she has been celebrated and praised repeatedly by Hillary Clinton. Three international eugenics congresses took place between 1912 and 1932 and were the global venue for scientists, politicians, and social leaders to plan and discuss the application of programs to improve human heredity in the early 20th century. This spun into many different arms of the same sinister beast. We will go through a couple of examples. Please research these names and organizations for yourselves, as they are deeply connected to the geopolitical and social developments of the last century. The Galton Institute in the United Kingdom, founded by Sybil Gotto in 1907 as the Eugenics Education Society, with the aim of promoting the research and understanding of eugenics. We cannot stress the importance of this organization enough, go on to Wikipedia and look at the complete list of its members. It consisted of many prominent members, for example, Arthur Balfour, issuer of the Balfour Declaration of 1917, a letter to Lord Rothschild affirming the government's support for the establishment of a national home for the Jewish people in Palestine, then part of the Ottoman Empire. 
John Maynard Keynes, English economist whose ideas fundamentally changed the theory and practice of macroeconomics and the economic policies of governments. Margaret Sanger was of course also a prominent member of this organization. Our last example of a prominent member of the institute was Alfred Ploetz, who first proposed the theory of racial hygiene, race-based eugenics, in Germany, in his Racial Hygiene Basics, Grundlinien einer Rassenhygiene, in 1895. He also sat on the Nazis Expert Advisory Committee for Population and Racial Policy, together with a man called Ernst Rudin. Rudin oversaw the German Institute for Psychiatric Research under the umbrella of the Kaiser Wilhelm Society. Rudin was among the first to write about the dangers of hereditary defectives and the supposed value of the Nordic race as culture creators. Funding for this institute came primarily from the American Rockefeller Foundation. What are the odds? As far as coincidences go, International Planned Parenthood Federation, IPPF, was founded by Swedish RFSU and other actors, and the RFSU remains IPPF Swedish Member Association. The RFSU was founded in 1933 and is a pioneering Swedish organization working in the field of sexual and reproductive health and rights. Let's see what they themselves write on their website. RFSU advocates and influences Swedish and international agreements on sexual and reproductive health and rights. Much of this work is done with partners, for us, partnership is a fundamental way of working. We channel support to civil society organizations in a number of countries. We also work with organizations and networks in Brussels, Geneva and New York, to secure strong support for our cause in international agreements, and to ensure their implementation. If you think that this organization share the same view on eugenics as Margaret Sanger did, you'd be right. The founder of the RFSU was a woman called Elise Ottesen Jensen, a Norwegian-Swedish sexual educator, journalist and liberal socialist agitator. Here she is pictured together with Margaret Sanger. In the 1940s, she gathered representatives from various family planning organizations for a meeting in Stockholm, which resulted in the founding of the organization IPPF, International Planned Parenthood Federation, of which she was president for 1959-1963. She was also active as editor and responsible publisher of the popular Journal of Psychology and Sexuality. Although Elise Ottesen Jensen was the face of the Swedish eugenics movement, which was masquerading as a sexual education initiative, someone else was driving the social engineering required to push the population in the right direction. Behind the wheel of Western social engineering was Swedish husband and wife, Gunnar and Alva Myrdal. Gunnar and Alva Myrdal's book Crisis in the Population Issue from 1934 is one of the most talked about domestic political writings of the 20th century. This book highlights, among other things, the importance of the responsibility for child-rearing being shared between parents and society, through trained child educators. Alva was strongly critical of the development within the activities for preschool children in Sweden. Therefore, she published the book Stadsbarn, Children of the City, in 1935, where she presented ideas for a new reformed Swedish preschool, based on modern child psychology. She believed that the childcare of the time, the crib and the kindergartens, were both deficient. She founded the Social Pedagogical Seminary in 1936, where she worked as a teacher in the education of the preschool teachers. Alva said that so far not enough consideration has been given to the latest pedagogical research in preschool teacher education. Thus, her education sought to integrate the new research findings in child psychology into teaching. Social studies were also emphasized, as was the women's personal development. The mental formatting of the Swedish population was picking up speed. In 1938, Alva and Gunnar Myrdal traveled to the United States. In 1941, in the USA, Alva published the book Nation and Family, which was about Swedish family and population policy. During World War II, she also lived periodically in Sweden. Alva Myrdal was strongly involved in the debate on women's liberation. She wanted to create a society where women could participate on equal terms in working life and where men would participate in housework. 
she believed that such a society would also benefit the children. More manpower in the workforce and destruction of the nuclear family, all at the same time, both in Sweden and the USA. Gunnar Myrdal was a Swedish economist, sociologist, and social democratic politician. Myrdal was part of something called the Stockholm School, which is a term for a group of economists, active from the 1930s and four decades onwards. What these economists had in common was that they were influenced by the British economist John Maynard Keynes and the Swede Knut Wicksell. John Maynard Keynes was a member of the Galton Eugenics Institute and was really influenced by the Swede Knut Wicksell. Wicksell is a name most people have never heard of, for obvious reasons. Swedish interests have always had a tendency to act without being seen. In 1944, while in the USA, Gunnar Myrdal authored a scientific study of race relations, funded by the Carnegie Foundation. The study was called An American Dilemma, The Negro Problem and Modern Democracy. Let's take a quote from the study. There is no doubt that the overwhelming majority of white Americans desire that there be as few Negroes as possible in America. If the Negroes could be eliminated from America or greatly decreased in numbers, this would meet the whites' approval, provided that it could be accomplished by means which are also approved. Correspondingly, an increase of the proportion of Negroes in the American population is commonly looked upon as undesirable. White prejudice and discrimination keep the Negro low in standards of living, health, education, manners and morals. This, in its turn, gives support to white prejudice. White prejudice and Negro standards thus mutually cause each other. One could speculate if the point of this study was really aimed to benefit the black population, or simply a study on how to best achieve the long-term goals of the eugenicists. The black population was growing too fast, and becoming an obvious threat to the agenda, in the eyes of these mad eugenicists. Birth control was no longer considered enough. Thus came the pro-abortion lobby, and finally they managed to get what they wanted, abortions made legal per the Constitution, by the decision in Roe v. Wade. We can at this point certainly state, that these insane people promoting eugenics and the current structure of society, are all connected historically and dates all the way back to the early 1900s, if not even further. As we've now established, the question of abortion, is really a question of promoting the deep state's agenda, through eugenics. Now someone might say, but everyone cannot be in on it? No, everyone doesn't have to be. The business side of abortion is a billion-dollar industry. Add to that, the tremendous profits, acquired from the sale of aborted and mutilated fetuses. The major benefactors of aborted fetuses, is primarily the cosmetics industry and the medical and genetical research industries. Self-serving interests, like we've said before, are much easier to control and have follow a specific agenda, as they are driven by their own greed, and cannot grasp the bigger picture. Regardless of your religious, moral, ethical or philosophical stance on abortion, this is about destroying the deep state's agenda and promote the value of human life. There has been 63,459,781 abortions in the USA, since Roe v. Wade. We can no longer turn a blind eye to our history and pretend we didn't know better. The time has now come for the general population to deal with reality. Thank you for listening. <laughs>